How's it going guys? My name's Finn. Welcome to Treehouse Overland. Today we're going to be doing an in-depth build video on my 2006 Sequoia. Alright, so I bought this truck about three years ago. It was completely stock except for a K&N cold air intake. This is a budget-minded build, but I did choose to buy once, cry once on a few essential things. I've done most of the work myself and learned a heck of a lot along the way. One of my main focuses on this build has been articulation since I don't have lockers yet. I'd rather keep all four tires on the ground and slow roll over large obstacles than constantly losing traction and having to back up and full send it, potentially breaking something and leaving me and my family stranded out in the middle of nowhere. This is a far cry from my younger years in my Jeep CJ, and I'm sure most of you can relate. These are 35 by 12 and a half R17s. They're the Neo Terra Neo Max Mud Terrains. These are generic 10 ply tires, guys. I've just always had great luck with generic tires. And those are wrapped around nine inch wide Pro Comp steel wheels. I would have preferred a 16 inch rim, but to do the big brake upgrade, you need a 17 inch rim to fit those massive calipers. I got this set of five wheels and tires for less than the price of just four brand name tires alone. All right, let's get into the front suspension. I replaced the lower control arm bushings with the Daystar polyurethane kit. I wouldn't wish that job on my worst enemy. Absolute torture. Blow torches were involved, drills, screwdrivers, knives were involved. It was horrible. But the result is the front suspension flexes so easily. It's got so much freedom. You don't have those rubber bushings with all that preload fighting against you. So I'm glad I did it, but I do it again. Next. I got rid of the eccentric bolts and went with the 333 Fabrications Cam Eliminator Kit. It comes with these plates, one for each side, times four obviously, and then these giant grade eight bolts with nylock nuts that go through and basically instead of rotating to get aligned, you've got a negative setting, a neutral setting, and a positive setting. So to fit these 35s, I set mine up negative in the front and positive in the rear. The rear side is out all the way towards the tire. I was needing an alignment every couple months before I put these in. Such a simple thing made such a dramatic difference. My truck would stay aligned after torturing it time and time again. It would still go down the road straight, so. That along with this SPC upper control arm allows this tire to clear the inside here. I obviously had to do some trimming, banging, cutting, but they clear very well. And I can actually hit pretty big bumps without any rub. It's when I start to hit the bigger stuff and this thing flexes out that I start to get rub right here. At the same time, I did the lower ball joints. I went OEM, because that's just what you do. I wasn't sure who did these last on my truck. This is a California truck, so rust is very minimal. Most of the bolts come out no problem. Frame looks really good. Everything under here looks pretty good. A little shot of the skid plates. For upper control arms, I went with SPC. The SPC adjustable uppers. You need these if you're gonna be installing these. These take all your adjustment. You can throw it out the window. So your only adjustment is gonna be up top here. But it's plenty. So these are polyurethane bushings as well. Rebuildable, greasable. They've been great. For shocks, I went Old Man Emu Nitro Charger Struts. And I paired them with the Old Man Emu 2888 springs. I also got some new spring isolators. Recently I added a Delrin spacer because my front was started drooping from all the weight of the bumper and the skid plates and everything. The one inch spacer, it's an eBay special. It did just what I wanted it to do. I wish I would have checked that little box and paid Josh at First Gen Off-Road to assemble these for me because it's dangerous, it sucks. I nearly broke the tool I rented. It's just a neatish job, but he's got a great press, gets it done no problem, so just throwing that out there. These springs combined with the spacer, it gets me about four inches of lift. These front bump stops are energy suspension, universal bump stops. So these looked great. I pulled my old ones off and I compared the threads and they were way off pitch was totally different. I said, you know what, I'm just gonna try it. And I screwed it in and miraculously it screwed in like two thirds of the way before it started getting jammed up. So I took them out, I cut one third of the threads off and I screwed them up there and they've been there ever since. I had to use vice grips for the last couple turns, but they've been fun. I also did the Total Chaos Spindle Gusset Weld It Yourself kit. Got a separate video on that if you wanna check it out. And for brake lines, I did Crown Stainless Steel. And for color, I chose black, and I think it's uh, four to five inches extended. That about does it for the front suspension. Let's move back to the sway bar. 
So first I was using the suspension max extended sway bars and they were fine. They did exactly what they were supposed to do. But I wanted something that I could take on and off. Personally, I noticed a dramatic increase in articulation when the sway bar is removed. I went through many different tests and iterations and versions before I finally settled on this. And this is what I'm testing right now. It's basically two quick disconnect ball joints, a half inch, 20 pitch stainless steel rod threaded between them. product by any means but I am testing it I've been riding around for like three months it's working great uh, you may notice another difference in my sway bar my sway bar bolt comes out this way I couldn't find any solution for a quick disconnect sway bar with the OEM sway bar setup with the hole being like this because it requires the bushings and then I tried I did a piece of angle a little bracket that I made but in the end I said you know what and I hacked these off Right here, I toned them out and then I flipped it 90 degrees and welded it back up. Tainted it and now it kind of looks like it belongs there. Pops right off. Take that one off too. There it is. And then I remove the other one and then I just fold it up and zip tie it up or something like that. But like I said, still in the testing phases, working great. If you guys are curious how much articulation I gained by removing the front sway bar links, stick around to the end. I did a quick comparison video. Siberian bushings for the sway bar. I used Moog at first because it was all I could get. They were awful. They got wallowed out within a matter of months. Go Siberian, pay the extra couple bucks. You'll be glad you did. For the steering rack, I did an energy suspension polyurethane kit. When I first got my Sequoia, that was like the really only thing that was wrong with it is those rubber bushings were shot out. Guys, if your steering is sloppy, get yourself some poly bushings. It tightens everything in the front end up. All right, CV axles. I'm running this CVJ remanufactured Toyota axles with the high angle inner boot, and they have been great. No complaints, no weird noises, no brakes. We're doing awesome. I had a dip drop kit when I first got my lift. But I started doing some math and crunching some numbers and you know, you get one degree of CV axle relief, but you lose a whole inch of ground clearance. So that, that really wasn't my cup of tea. I decided to ditch the dip drop kit, especially when I got the high angle inner boots and I've been fine ever since. I also recently did inner and outer tie rod ends. They were getting crummy. And for that stuff I used the AutoZone lifetime warranty. The higher end of what you can get at AutoZone. Okay, let's move on back. To the rear. I bent a rear control arm a while back and I said I don't want to do that again. I started looking into options and there were three available at the time. APOC Industries was one of them and there were two others that I'll put on the screen. Anyways, APOC was the cheapest and it came with all four. I decided to go with them. What I noticed pretty early is that since both ends were polyurethane bushings, the flex wasn't that great. So I got creative, started looking at the specs and the sizes and the threads and stuff and I found out that Johnny joints screw right in here. So these are Curry Johnny joints and they give me all the articulation I need. I got a video on this that I'll link. It was my first YouTube video I ever did. And then if you come with me under here, I'll show you one of the lowers. The lower and for the lowers i did heim joints from barnes four wheel drive and if you watch that video i listed all the parts i used all the part numbers everything you need they're greasable on both ends which is good the heims get a little squeaky from time to time but some bike chain lubricant will keep them clean and quiet for about four months you can choose to mount your stuff here and the mounts weren't really in the right positions for any of this stuff so i decided to leave my emergency brake lines loose the rear shocks made by Dobinson's GS59-685 and they've been awesome. They were and I think maybe still are the uh, longest travel shock for the Sequoia that anybody's found yet. And I actually think they're meant for a Land Cruiser but they work really well here. Springs, our old man Emu 2860s, they've been great too. When I'm loaded down, my rear sags about two inches. When I'm loaded down good for like a weekend of camping with my wife and my four kids, I think we weighed my rig once and it was over 7,000 pounds, so it's understandable. And I'm running Daystar Universal polyurethane bump stops in the back too. You just have to drill your own holes, no biggie. Video on that coming soon. All right, let's talk about the Panhard bar. At first, I did the Panhard correction kit by I'm Keith. It's a bracket that you weld on that raises the Panhard bar bolt location about three inches. So that helped tremendously. 
The goal is to have your pan hard bar parallel to the ground. My axle wasn't completely centered, so I started looking at adjustable pan hard bars. There was only one on the market that I saw. Pretty expensive, and when I looked at it, I just thought, you know, I have 95% of that stuff already. All I need is the heim joint and, you know, the jam nut and the threaded bung. So I decided to use my factory bar and make it adjustable. I ordered a few parts from Barnes Four Wheel Drive. I didn't know the inner diameter of the bar, so I ordered a one inch and a one and a quarter inch threaded bung, and then I ordered a uh, heim with misalignment spacers that equal out the two inch mounting width of this bracket. So I got a full video on that. If you guys want to check that out, I'll tell you. People said I'd notice a difference, but I wasn't convinced that I would. I had this thing happening when I would be driving 50 miles an hour or more. I would turn and my front end would turn and then it would feel like my back end would kind of turn afterwards. It was like a one, two, one, two type of thing. It was like my front wheels were turning separately than my rear wheels. This totally eliminated that. It feels like the vehicle is one with the road again. It doesn't feel tippy at all, even though I'm not running rear sway bars. It was a great improvement and it was a great idea. And I'm Keith did an excellent job executing it. This is the, one of the mounting locations for the factory rear sway bar. I took it off to do a job. I forget exactly what I was doing, something with the suspension. Put it to the side, and when I got everything buttoned up that night, I took my truck for a ride. To be honest, I forgot the thing wasn't even on. I couldn't tell any difference whatsoever in the ride quality. And maybe that's because I had just installed brand new stiff springs. I don't know, but I never put it back on. I like to have that additional articulation. Before I took it off, I did Siberian bushings. I'm running a full set of skid plates by Skid Row Off-Road, and these things have been awesome, guys. No complaints. They do add weight to your vehicle, but that's to be expected. So we got the front skid, the oil pan skid, transmission skid, and the transfer case skid. The transfer case skid is spec'd for a Tundra, so you do need to drill into the frame, and the transmission skid just needs to be trimmed a little bit. I got a step-by-step -step video detailing all that if you're interested. And lastly, for protection, we got these catalytic converter guards. This is a newer product that Skid Row offers. It's not spec'd for this model year because of this bar, but with a little finagling and a floor jack, you can get it to work just fine. I got a video for that as well. So the front bumper is a weld-it-yourself kit by Coastal Off-Road aka an adult jigsaw puzzle that can hurt you. This was my first welding project and I learned a lot putting this thing together. So these are high clearance front and rear bumpers. If you notice going down this fairly steep incline, neither bumper touches the ground or the hill at any point in time. So these bumpers really help with your approach and departure angles. I got it powder coated and tried to match the Toyota Silver. No offense to anyone with black bumpers, but I just didn't want to be part of the black bumper club. The lights are from Harbor Freight, and the winch is a Badlands Apex 12K. The bumper mounts two bolts here, and then one, two, three, four bolts there. I couldn't fit the winch in there. It was too tight, so we actually had to make brackets, me and my buddy Brian, and extended the frame rails out by about an inch and a half. So this meant the bolt holes didn't line up anymore, so I just welded it. These D-rings are some Amazon specials. Well, the problem with the coastal off-road bumper is that it leaves a big gap right there. And so, when you close your hood, it looks like you got some front teeth missing or something. They did end up making some sort of attachment. I got this pretty early on in its release, so I just cut this plastic off the old bumper. And then when I want to use the winch, I just unscrew it here and here. Pull it out. This gives us access to the winch. And this had to be cut out to fit this guy. We could have relocated the brain somewhere, but I didn't want to go through all that mess. It's still a real tight fit, even with this bumper pushed out. Before ordering this, I tried like crazy to contact Billy Simmons over there at Proof Force Fab because I really wanted one of his bumpers. I couldn't get any emails or calls returned. I figured he was just super busy, so I went with the Coastal Off-Road kit. And I'm actually glad I did in the long run. I was also checking out Addicted Off-Road. They got a couple awesome options, but I was on a budget and I wanted to learn how to weld. The rear bumper is from Coastal Off-Road as well. I chose the dual swing out. So you can get these pretty much however you want them. It does look good without the swing outs. It looks really good. I'll put a, a few pictures up real quick. Just got back from powder coating.
So there is a jerry can holder that goes right here. It's just not on yet. This is a 35, mounts on here, no problem. I'll show you how they open. Got a little safety latch there. This thing's open real easy. No squeaks, no jiggles, no rattles, which is the amazing part. This thing goes right down the road, off-road or on-road. No rattles. This is the second major welding project I took on, and it was a ton of fun. And you know what? I can look at these little imperfections and say, yeah, I did that. I made that. If you guys are interested how these go together, I got one video detailing the bumper build and another detailing the dual swing out build. Now these rock sliders are made by a company called Rocky Road Outfitters. And we can have a debate in the comment section on if these are real sliders or not. But at the end of the day, I don't care. So these aren't weld on sliders. They utilize the factory mounting points for the side steps. And they also bolt through the pinch weld in six different spots on each side with grade eight bolts and nuts. Some of you hardcore old school 4x4 guys might not like this idea. But Rocky Road Outfitters is a group of old school 4x4 guys and they claim this mounting system is far superior to anything that you could weld on. And trust me guys, I'm skeptical too, but I've never had a problem being the guinea pig. So if I end up having bad luck with these things, I'll be the first to let you guys know. If nothing else, the steps work great for helping the little ones get up into the back seat, considering it's 21 and a half inches off the ground. Roof rack is the Sherpa Belford. I think it's the nicest looking rack for the Sequoia and very functional as well. Got lots of room to mount stuff. You can see I got my high lift strapped up here. Guys, before I could afford a rack, I wanted to make use of that wasted space above the driver and passenger. So I went ahead and made a wooden rack to strap my giant military trunk to. It ended up working out great and didn't look that bad either. So when I was shopping for roof racks, there were a few different options at the time. First, you had the Gobi rack. I personally don't like the look of the Gobi racks. I think the profile is way too high. And to get it made the way I wanted it, it was going to cost twice what the Sherpa rack cost me. Then there was a company called PP Engineering. They make a rack that looks similar to the Sherpa rack, but the pictures on the website were horrible. The air dam, I don't even know what's going on there with all those bolts. And it was $300 more than the Sherpa. I couldn't find any reviews on this rack anywhere. These guys also list rock sliders for the Sequoia. So leave a comment below if you've had any experience with PP Engineering. Now this one's called the Pro Speed Rack and this wasn't available when I bought mine. It has characteristics similar to the Sherpa Rack but it looks to have even a lower profile. And that price is killing them. I'm running a 22 inch light bar from Harbor Freight and if I'm being honest, I'm probably due for an upgrade in the lights department. I did have the uh, Gobi rear ladder mounted up for a while but when I put the dual swing outs on, it had to go away. So I'm either gonna sell it or try to integrate it you know, from the bumper to the rack somehow on the side. I've seen a few guys do that. So I didn't do too much inside, at least in the front, but you got the WeatherTech mats, mandatory. I also got the Husky liner for the back seat. It basically catches all the spills and all the crap. These are somewhere. Everything's always in the works with me. I took out the cigarette lighter and added a quick charge USB. I did a nine inch stereo install, Android Auto, Apple CarPlay. It's an Amazon special and it works okay. So up here is an Amazon special Switch Pro in a mount made by a gentleman by the name of Joseph Chan. I'll put a link to his stuff. He does, I think right now, four items for the Sequoia. Check this man's stuff out. It's awesome. This thing fit like a glove. Very, very well engineered. So I run my wire, you know, down through here, through the column, up through here. Funny thing about this is when I put this bar here, it covered up the V8 emblem. And I'm that vain, I guess, that I needed to move it over four inches so that people could see it. You gotta let them know I'm not a forerunner. 
at the K&N cold air intake. It was the only mod on the truck when I bought it. Not sure if it adds any power, but it sounds great. So up here, it's kind of a mess right now, but basically this is the um, brain for the Switch Pro. So this is where all the wires go to. This is the breaker for it. This is all fastened to a piece of plexiglass that I cut to fit over the fuse boxes perfectly with that really strong 3M, not Velcro, but whatever it's called so this this is not going anywhere this positive and this negative leading back to the firewall okay here's the electronics here are the two wires i told you about come up here feed the dc to dc charger i also have a solar charge controller i don't have a panel at the moment i had one that was just too big and bulky so i'm in the market for something smaller but not in any rush this thing provides plenty of power. For power storage, I use the Battleborn 100 amp hour, and I just got it strapped down right here for now. Fuse box, positive and negative buses, which this is all in the works too, and a 1200 watt inverter. I use Victron stuff. They have a five year, no questions asked warranty. I've had no issues with any of this stuff and you can monitor pretty much everything with your phone. With Bluetooth, you can tell how much battery you have, how much current you're getting, how much power's flowing to the battery, how much power's coming from the sun. So it's actually just really cool. I got my air compressor, my ARB twin stuffed in the headrest slot. I've actually never seen this done and I'm not sure why. It works great. It was a pain in the ass getting it in there, but it works. What else can I show you that make gonna make any sense? This is another negative bus popped in right here. Basically what I did, and I filmed all this without giving away too much, and I got a video coming out on this too. I took this whole panel out and mounted all the electronics to it. I put wood behind the heat sinks of those two, some plywood so that it wouldn't melt the plastic. There's also some insulation between the ARB mounting plate and the plastic because that thing gets pretty hot. There's plenty of room up here for air. So far, I haven't had any issues. The hose runs down through the floor and the outlet is right here. Works great. When I want to turn it on, I just come around here. So I had a whole platform system back here that I made out of plywood. I went through several versions of that as well and it just was too heavy. Everything was too damn heavy. Uh, I made a fridge slide. That was kind of cool because it, it housed the fridge. And the fridge slid out right here. And it was nice because you could stack stuff on top of it. You didn't have to take the fridge out or move stuff off the top of the fridge to access the fridge. And I liked that a lot, but all of it just added so much weight. Now for this, to get this mounted, I traced the window onto some cardboard and then I transferred it onto some plexiglass and made my own brackets. There's five of them holding this thing together, six actually. And then I put rubber underneath all these feet and we get down the road just fine. I believe in giving credit where credit is due. So I did actually get this idea from Rego Fabrications. They make a molly panel for this window. And when I saw how they mounted it to the seat belt, to the O-fish handle, and then to these two points right here, I said, yeah, I could do that. I could do that, man. And I actually did ask them if they'd sell me one because I needed to have this seat belt operational. I do have four kids, but I never got a response. So I just said, you know what? I'll build it myself. Eventually, I'd like to have all the wires hidden. There are a ton of wires running back behind here already. I'd like to have this relocated somewhere. And I didn't want these runs from the inverter too long because I'd have to go so thick on the gauge. So it's here for now. It's doing fine. It's got its seat belt on. Here's the ground. Just ran it down to the bumper. The battery is a Battleborn 100 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery. It's plenty of power for our needs. We use it when we're camping to power the fridge. Tons of lights everywhere. The kids have a small TV for the top of the tent with a small PC attached to it and they watch their movies and then obviously to charge multiple devices. If we're conservative, it'll last two nights, but if we got the solar panel going, it's topped off by 10 in the morning. And if it gets too low, I just have to run the engine for 10 minutes and it powers it right back up. So no complaints there. The fridge is an Iceco, I think it's 60 liter. It's been a trooper. It works great, it holds its temperature, it draws very little power, and it's rugged. Keep your eyes open for an ice coast sale. I got mine for 5.30 shipped. So we obviously use a rooftop tent, and uh, I feel like all that stuff is beyond the scope of this video. If you guys wanna see the entire camping setup and how we do it with four kids in one truck for days at a time, leave a comment below. I think people are finally starting to understand how legit these trucks are and how capable. When I'm in four low, 
with the diff locked. I haven't gotten it myself into too many jams that I can't get out of. It's amazing, and especially with the first gear button engaged, going down steep hills and four low. You don't even have to touch the brakes. It's crazy. There are a few things on here I did strictly for cosmetics. This is one, the bug guard, the window vents. I did them because I liked how they look. I also got the front windows tinted to match the back because I think it looks a lot better. And um, I did a small strip across the windshield while I was there. I also did the headlights. Amazon, I've seen a lot of guys do these recently. It's not really a cool custom thing anymore. And guys, I'm running one inch wheel spacers, not because I need to, but because I like to. I like how it makes this truck look. All right guys, so all I did for this little comparison was back up this ramp until the rear passenger side tire lost traction. Then I got out and marked how far the driver's side tire made it up the ramp. So this first test is with the front sway bar links connected. Okay, this is test number two. Front sway bar is disconnected and we did make it further up the ramp this time by quite a bit. You can see I marked where we stopped last time with this stick of gum. I'm gonna go ahead and center this. Go ahead and measure that one once we get off. All right, now we're gonna take some measurements and this is nothing fancy. This is just a rough calculation. I brought the object down from the center of the hub and I'm just gonna go right to the edge of where it's at. It measures jank. First one's gonna be 26. Second one is 30.5. So that's four and a half inches, guys. So, for anyone who thinks that disconnecting your sway bars doesn't help that much, I'd agree. It might not if you have the stock lower control arm bushings. But these polyurethane bushings are so flexy. I mean, so we've got one arm totally flat, even actually reversed a little. And we're right up on our bump stops, smushing them, just kissing them actually. Okay, and then the other one is all the way extended. So they're doing two completely separate things. They're not fighting with each other. And actually, I only disconnected one sway bar. If you disconnect one, the other one can do what it wants. But we do have a wheel on the ground. You can see our, our last little dig out. So yeah, in my opinion, even a small increase in articulation is a win. For something like this, we're talking an extra four and a half inches, guys. Yes, please, I'll take it. Let's see how our other bump stop is looking. Just kissing there too. We're doing great on this fender. We definitely took out enough meat. And we're not coming anywhere close to the fuel lines. We'd have to go up an extra four inches to hit those. Bump stop will prevent that. 35s, guys, pretty good. All right guys, that about does it. Thanks for watching. If you feel you get any value from any of these videos I create, uh, consider becoming a subscriber. I have hundreds of hours of footage recorded of tons of installs, tons of modifications. So I got a lot of content coming down the pike. Please leave comments. I'm happy to answer any questions as long as they're not easily Googled. I try my best to respond to all your guys' comments. It's really fun interacting with you. I'm gonna leave you with some footage from the Ballinger OHV Park. We found this really cool dried up riverbed that basically turned into a rally course. It was a lot of fun. So until the next time, this is Finn with Treehouse Overland signing off. Yeah, listen to that. Sweet 4.7 baby.